What's up, family? How you doing? Come on in. I'm excited. This is Therapy Thursdays. I am your co-host, Isaac Curry. Listen, if this is your first time joining us on our Therapy Thursdays, please let us know in the comment section. I missed y'all. Look, cousins, I appreciate you all for showing up around the world. Let us know where you're streaming from, where you're replaying from. We want to hear from you. We welcome you. This is a place of healing and of growth. I'm excited because I've been up all night in a word that God has, has deposited Positive on the inside of me, and I really believe this is going to set someone free. Anybody want freedom today? No. Does anybody really want to be set free today? Listen, I'm excited. I'm so terribly excited to be able to share the word of God with you. Tanisha, Jerry, my brother, my sister, we thank you. We thank you for Redefined Ministries. Those from Relationships Without Walls, we're glad that you're here. Listen, are y'all ready for a word? Don't play with me. Y'all ready for a word? Type in the comment section. I'm ready for a word. This is a word that it, that you're going to keep chewing on for days to come. Trust me on this. Trust me on this. Somebody type rejection. Mm, 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 mm. Mm, 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 mm. I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited. Watch this. I'm going to pray with you. Then I'm just going to jump on into what I believe God is doing on today because today we're not playing. You know, we're never playing. But today, you know, there is something that needs to be deposited within you. And I can't, I, I got to give it to you. I can't even, I can't even wait. Right? Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, our God, we say thank you for this moment. You have ordained, preordained for the people who are here to be here right now. We're not here by accident. Some have come looking for something else. Some accidentally just ended up here. You're here because God wants you here. So God, thank you for bringing the ears and the hearts to this place on today. You have a word for us. So Lord, we open our hearts and ask that you meet us at the place of our greatest need and deficit. Lord, we bind and rebuke the spirit of defensiveness. Lord, we will hear, we will receive, and we will obey what you will deposit in us on today. It's in Jesus Christ's name we sign, seal, and deliver this prayer. And everyone said together, amen. Come on, if you're just tuning in, and if you're on replay, we welcome you. Today, I want to talk to you about the subject of rejection, right? Rejection is by far, listen to me, the most common wound that we will experience on this side of heaven. It is the most common reason that we withdraw, we become defensive, hypersensitive, isolate ourselves, detach ourselves, put barriers up. It is one of the, the most common reasons for relationship breakdown, for divorce, for trauma, for heartache. Somebody type rejection. Rejection isn't always, though, what happens to you. Sometimes rejection is a learned behavior. I'm going to come down your street. I'm going to knock on your door eventually. So just listen. Sometimes rejection isn't what somebody did to you, but it's an atmosphere. It's a learned behavior. It's something that you picked up from home. Sometimes rejection can be transferred. I know I'm, I'm going to make it make sense. Listen, I need to give this to you. Yes, rejection is a wound. It's a common wound. But what many people won't reveal and won't admit and won't share with you is that although rejection is a common wound, it's also more than a wound. How many of you know, type this, that rejection is a spirit? Just, just, just follow me. Type rejection is a spirit. And the problem is when we don't recognize 
rejection as a spirit, what it does is it finds a hiding place. It pitches a tent. It builds brick and mortar, kicks back, gets comfortable in the area of our emotions. When we don't recognize that rejection is, yes, a wound, it is also a spirit. And when we don't approach it this way, we we find half healing or we address it partially. And many of us don't realize that rejection will find a seat in our emotions, kick back, and it will remain there. Somebody say, I bind rejection in my life. I'm going somewhere. Rejection is the reason that men grow silent when he doesn't or when we don't feel hurt. It's it's the common reason that that man or a man will grow silent when he doesn't feel like you're hearing him rejection. So I just go silent. Rejection is the reason is is one of the common reasons that men withdraw when when we feel attacked or ridiculed or belittled or not respected because not to experience and receive respect is one thing, but we also interpret it as rejection. When you think about rejection, rejection is is one of the reasons that women will fight and get loud because she does not feel that you are considering her feelings and the only thing she knows is to talk louder, get louder, and to fight. Somebody type rejection. Rejection is a reason why, why many women will choose to stay. Because she doesn't feel that she wants to experience abandonment again. So she will stay in a place that she knows she shouldn't be or is not the best for her. But because she wants to avoid experiencing abandonment again, she would much rather just stay. Somebody say overstay. But if you don't deal with your fear of rejection, it's the most common wound that we will experience. If you don't learn to heal from the rejection because our mind experience, our conscious experiences rejection and translate it is into pain. So although we might experience uh, an infidelity, our our mind, our consciousness, it, it, it translated as a physical pain. It hurts. Have you ever experienced the sting of rejection? A closed door? Unfaithfulness, a lie told about you, unex, uh, unmet expectations. I'm talking about the sting of rejection, words that were spoken to you that 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 tormented your mind. I'm talking about rejection. Rejection is one of those things that many people don't realize in their marriage, in their relationships that they're really struggling from. It's the culprit. It's the puppeteer in your life that's making you respond the way you're responding, becoming so defensive. It's the reason that you respond the way you respond because defensiveness is your default response. And so, and so rejection is that puppeteer in our marriage, in our relationships, in our singleness. It's the reason that we make the decisions that we make. It's the reason that we surround ourselves with the people we surround ourselves with. It's the reason that when we look in the mirror, we don't stare long because we don't receive and accept the person that we see. I'm talking about rejection. Mm, 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 mm. It's the root pain that many of us deal with. I know throughout my adolescence, my childhood, my adolescence, and even my early adulthood, it was something that I never even realized was the reason that I chose the relationships that I chose. 
because I wanted to be the dominant one. I wanted to be the one that was needed. I wanted to be the one that avoided getting rejection. So I chose the relationships. I knew that I would be the one that was dominant. I'm talking about rejection. I only applied to schools that I knew I would get accepted to. I only applied for jobs that I knew that I would, would get approved for. I only did and, and, and I only did certain things. I only went down certain streets. I only opened certain doors. I only went in certain rooms that I knew I had a uh, a probability of, res- uh, of, or my probability of experiencing rejection was very low. All right, come on, come on. Rejection will impact how you do relationships. Are, are y'all listening? I'm going to take you to Genesis chapter 38 in just a moment, but I'm trying to I'm trying to set up the, the, the case. I'm trying to argue my case. I'm trying to pr- present to you the problem. It impacts how we do relationships. It robs you of your fulfillment and it can cripple and paralyze you in the area of your purpose. Because what something because of what happened to you when you were a child, because we will experience rejection at home as a child. And when we grow up into early adulthood and adulthood, all of the rejection we experience is nothing but a reiteration of the wound that we experience when mama cursed at us or when our daddy looked down upon us and never told us, thank you, good. Or for someone like me, my father was never there. Rejection. Come on, come on. An absent parent, a parent, the rivalry, the sibling rivalry, you experience unaddressed wounds. I'm talking about the rejection that we experience and we don't realize that this is rejection ruling our lives, dominating our minds. And so we double dare to enter into a relationship with someone. And then now we expect for them to cater to our rejection or the fact that we don't want to experience rejection. And we, we, we dress it up in, I need, someone who will affirm me. I need someone who will validate me. And so now he or she has to overcompensate for the wound that you won't identify or acknowledge is there and allow God to heal you from. And so I counsel relationships after relationships, broken marriages, singleness, divorced, widowed. I counsel. And what people don't often realize is that it's the culprit of that rejection that you experience the way someone mishandled you when you were young. And what you experience when you when you were on that job or what happened when you were in that relationship and that friendship. Somebody type, I rebuke the spirit of rejection over my life. Mm. And what rejection will do, what that spirit will do when it's embedded and ingrained in our lives, it will reveal itself in our inability to trust people. Our unwillingness to commit. One of the reasons that he doesn't want to commit is not that he 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 doesn't care about you. It's not that he he desires to hurt you. It's just that he's afraid of rejection and he doesn't even realize it. It's not an excuse and just one of the reasons. And so it shows in our inability to commit our need to be in control. It's the reason why we have surface level relationships and we can't forgive people. The bitterness, the silence, the fear of failure is all because of a wound. It's all because of a spirit that you have not acknowledged and identified is there. And now it's ruling your life. I bind, I bind, I bind the spirit of rejection. Today, I'm talking to you from the subject recovery from rejection. Because when we look in our text for today, in Genesis chapter 38, and you listen, if you if you double dare to walk with me, I promise God is about to blow your mind. But when we look in the text for today, the common theme in today's text, what you see, the motif that you see that is moving about in the text, 
is not one of Tamar. That's not the main character. Tamar isn't the main character. Judah isn't the main character. The main character in the text is rejection. And rejection is the reason that this text unfolds the way that it unfolds. And if you don't address the rejection in your life, it will become the main character calling the shots and the plays in your life. Watch this. In Genesis chapter 38, I want you to see what happens. The Bible says in verse 1, about this time, Judah left home, moved to Adalam, where he stayed with a, with a man named Hira. There he saw a Canaanite woman, the daughter of Shua, and he married her. And the Bible says he slept with her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son. That son's name was Er, E-R. Then she became pregnant again and, and, and she gave birth to another son. And that son's name was Onan, O-N-A-N. Then she gave birth to a third son. That third son's name was Sheila. That's the youngest of the three. At the time of Sheila's birth, they were living in a place called Kazib. Now keep reading. Where is the rejection? I don't. See, I only see love and happiness and the reproducing of, of children. This seems to be fine. Just keep reading. Somebody say keep reading. In the course of time, Judah, the father, arranged for Ur, his firstborn, born to get married. And so he found a young woman by the name of Tamar. But Ur was a wicked man in God's sight, so God killed him. Verse 8, then Judah said to Ur, that is, you know, uh, the Ur's brother, that is Onan, Onan is the second eldest, and so he goes to Onan and he says, Onan, according to the law, you are required to go into your brother's wife, or now a former wife, and you are to marry her, you are to sleep with her so that she can have an heir to your brother's life, to your brother's land, to all the things that the firstborn is given. So he says, I want you to go in to Tamar and I want you to marry her. I want you to sleep with her and I want her to reproduce so that your brother can have great land and his lineage can be plentiful. And then the Bible teaches us, are y'all listening, that Onan did not want to, somebody say selfishness, he did not want to sleep with her so that she could have a hair, an heir that he does not benefit from. So the Bible reads, instead, it's not that he didn't want to sleep with her. He just didn't want her to, to reproduce of a seed that he does not benefit from selfishness because he's not thinking about her. He's only thinking about himself. But this is the law. May not be the law in 2022, but this is the law at this time. And so the Bible says, are y'all listening? That he did want to sleep with her. And so he goes in and the Bible says, whenever he had intercourse. The operative, operative term is whenever, which means that it wasn't just one time. So whenever I had a desire, you know, to, to feel that desire and, and I wanted to, to, to have sex and I wanted to release, I'm going to go into Tamar. And whenever he wanted to have intercourse with her, the Bible says that he would have intercourse. He would know her. But when it came time for him to climax, I'm talking about scripture. I'm not talking the way Isaac wants to talk. The Bible says that he spilled the semen on the ground. Depending on your text, it says that he emitted on the ground. Why? He did not want her to bear children that he did not benefit from so he would have sex with her. But he didn't want there to be benefit from that intercourse. So he would continue to go in and have sex with her, but he wanted to make sure that she didn't have children. So whenever it came time for him to climax, he would, he, he, he would release on the ground. And when God discovered this, God didn't like this and God considered that a sin. So God killed Onan. Mm. Somebody say, preach Isaac. I'm just reading the scripture. This is preach worthy. It preaches by itself. 
And so keep in mind, Tamar is still on the other side of this, somebody type rejection. Hmm. Because she has feelings, she has emotions. And when you transfer rejection, and sometimes when you learn rejection, what it will do is it will numb your ability to have empathy. And because you learn not to be empathetic, you don't consider other people when you make decisions. And so the Bible says that he goes in and he has sex, but he releases and now he dies. And so the next thing is supposed to happen. What's supposed to happen is she is now supposed to get married to the latest son, Sheila. That's the youngest son. But the Bible says that Judah, this is what Judah tells her. <laughs> Ooh, uh, get to the verse, verse 11. And so then Judah said to Tamar, his, his daughter-in-law, go back to your parents' home. Remain a widow. Somebody say, wait. Go back to your father's house, your parents' house, and wait. And everywhere you go, you have to wear this dark clothing so it will show people that you are a widow and that you are grieving. And so go back there and wait until my youngest son is of age. And when he is of age, I'm going to bring him to you so that he can marry you and that you all can live happily ever after. Somebody say, wait. But the Bible also gives us insight into what's going on in his heart. Judah did, he never planned to make his son get married to Tamar. But he told Tamar, somebody say rejection, that just wait, I'm going to come back and you're going to marry my youngest son. And the Bible says that she did exactly what was told of her. She never, she never complained. She never spoke a word. She has no voice. All she does is obey and she waits. And then she's experiencing rejection. She goes home. And here's an operative word in verse 12. It says some years later, which what it communicates to us that it's not next tomorrow. It's not next year. It's not three years. Many years pass by. Sheila is of age. Judah's wife dies. He's now grieving. And now he goes up to a location, a city so that he can handle some business and so that he can grieve. Word gets to Tamar that her father-in-law is located at a place that she can get to. And so she concocts and devises a plan in her mind because when you experience rejection repeatedly, it sometimes will cause you to do some unpredictable things. I wish I had somebody to say amen, somebody who didn't want to, to, to put on, somebody who can be honest. I'm talking about when you, when someone has rejected you, when you have experienced abandonment and betrayal, sometimes you find yourself tolerating things that you wouldn't tolerate and devising plans because you got to be in control because I don't want to experience rejection. I need to help you. Watch this. Verse 14. Tamar was aware that Shayla had grown up, but no arrangements had been made for her, for, for her to come and marry him. So, everybody with me? Yes, I'm reading, but I'm preaching. So she changed out of her widow's clothing and covered herself in a veil. Mm, I wish I had something to, to disguise myself. She covered herself in a veil. Mm. Mm, mm. Then she sat down by the road at the entrance of the village of Enaim, which is the road to Timnah. And the Bible says Judah noticed her. And Judah thought she was a prostitute because the way she was dressed, the way she presented herself. Don't be mad if he responds in a way that you perhaps are presenting yourself because when you're presenting yourself as lonely, as desperate, he treats you that way. But when you, when you present yourself as confident, having values, having standards, he has to govern himself accordingly. But she disguised herself. And when she disguised herself, he thought she was a prostitute and he propositioned her. 
Mm. How much would it take for me to have sex with you? He asked her. But what's the point? The point is she was aware and her greatest response to avoid experiencing rejection again was to disguise herself. So I won't experience rejection again. I'm going to take life in my own hands. God is taking too long. And so I much prefer, look at, look at Tamar, to disguise myself. Because if I can disguise myself, I can get the results that I want. Recovering from rejection. Because someone who loved you dropped you. Someone who you trusted and depended upon mismanaged you. Someone who you gave your heart to broke it. Have you ever experienced rejection? Tamar is now getting married. Finally, I'm getting married. Her first husband dies. She grieves. Her second husband mishandles her, uses her, but no one ever says anything about her. And yet she's trusting Judah again, but Judah is not considering her heart. And so now, after experiencing so much pain, so much rejection, doors closed, closed door after closed door after closed door. Her father-in-law, her parent, mishandles her heart to the point where she decided to disguise herself. And when she disguises herself, she then gets the result that she desired for. Mm. Her end goal was marriage. And she was going to get married by any means necessary. Are y'all listening? And so then, when her father-in-law thinks that she is a harlot, a prostitute, he makes a proposal to her. And she says, what are you going to give me? What do you want? He asks. She says, give me your walking stick and give me your identification card and your cord. If you give these things to me to hold on to, then we can sleep together. And the Bible says that they slept together because rejection will have you lessening and lowering your standards because you said to yourself, if I don't stay here, I'm not going to get anything better. And because I don't want to experience abandonment again or rejection in anybody walking away, I'd much rather stay here than to not have anything, than to be alone. That's the greatest lie that the devil can whisper into your ears. I break that covenant that the devil with his mouth has with your ears. But listen to this. So they have intercourse. She gets pregnant three months later. Everyone discovers that your daughter-in-law is pregnant. He said she needs to be killed. And then she sent to him the identification card. He discovered that he slept with her. And then she was safe. She gives birth to twins. Mm. Here is the thing. When you think about rejection, you see it all through this text, right? And there's something else I want to help you with, but there's five symptoms, five or six symptoms that will help you to discover if 
whether or not you're wrestling with uh, rejection or the spirit of rejection or this wound is ruling you. Can I, can I give you five symptoms so that you know whether or not rejection is something that is dominating your life, something that you need to give God the full, the full, like, like you, he needs to control. He needs to have jurisdiction. You need to give all of, let me help you. Whether or not Rejection is in your bloodline because Onan rejected Tamar. But Onan only did what he learned from his father. Everybody, everybody with me? Onan's behavior was learned behavior. Onan's selfishness was a learned selfishness. So Onan only did what he saw Papa do. He learned how to reject because some rejection is initiated, not necessarily received. Onan rejected Tamar because he saw how his father treated people. What do you mean? I told you before that Rejection is all, all, often transferred and learned. So Onan did what his father did, but Judah did what he learned from his father. What are you talking about, Isaac? When you do your Bible homework, you'll discover in Genesis chapter 29 that Judah had a mom. His mom was named Leah, L-E-A-H. And Leah had a sister by the name of Rachel. And the Bible teaches us that Jacob, when he saw Rachel and he kissed her, he fell in love with her. But then her father Laban didn't want him to just marry Rachel. He also wanted him, Jacob, to marry Leah. And so he plays a trick on Jacob, that is Judah's daddy, that's Onan's granddaddy. Now watch how this gets transferred. And so Jacob then, the Bible says, had to marry Leah and he was, he grieved at the fact that he had to marry a woman who the Bible says did not have a sparkle in her eye, which meant that she wasn't too physically appealing, or at least not as beautiful as her sister Rachel. Somebody say rejection. You experience that in your own childhood, in your own life, comparison with your brother, comparison with your sister. And so the Bible teaches us that Judah's mom was rejected by his father, Jacob. He did not want to marry, nor did he want to have children with Leah, but he had to. And so the Bible got so sticky that the Bible says that God in chapter 29 looked upon Leah and saw that she was unloved, rejected. And so he caused her to have children because she was unloved. She had one child. And you know what she said? She had one child. I'm talking about uh, the spirit of rejection. And after she had one child, the Bible says she surely knew that Jacob would love her. Didn't happen. She had a second child. Surely if I have this second child with this man who I got married to, he's now going to, to fall in love with me. Your sex will not cause him to stay. And the Bible says she, got, she had a third child, Judah, and still did not love her. Rejection, rejection. So Judah learned as he grew older that Jacob, his father, didn't really care for his mother. And he heard the stories and he learned how his father rejected his mother. And so that was transferred unto him. And so he learned how to ignore. He learned how to withdraw. He learned how to disengage. He learned how to be selfish and not have a care in the world only for him. What do you mean? When you look at, at Genesis chapter 34, I'm trying to give you a Bible lesson, but I'm trying to also release you from that bondage. In Genesis chapter 34, the Bible says that his daughter, that is Dinah, got raped by a man by the name of Shechem. And when she got raped by the name by a man by the name of Shechem, J Jacob had a responsibility to respond, to show anger, to at least tr try to get some type of vengeance. But the Bible says he held his peace. Read the Bible. 
He held his peace and all of his sons, Judah, all of his sons were upset because the father was not angry and did not even fight back. And the only response that Jacob gave was that I don't want to mess up my reputation in the city. Even Dinah, his daughter, experienced rejection. So rejection is a common theme in their bloodline. Hmm? And so Judah learned rejection from home. He didn't have to personally experience more than he had to see it. This is why you need to, to get the spirit of rejection, the atmosphere of rejection, the selfishness out of your life because your children pick it up. And so this is why now Judah, when he looks at his sons, he only thinks about his sons and nothing else. And he's willing to send a woman on her way and not care for her life only to protect himself. But how do you know that rejection is in your bloodline? Number one, the majority of the relationships in your life are transactional and surface. The majority of the relationships in your life are transactional. I'm close to you because I get something from you or you do something for me, right? And so it's transactional or it's surface. When you think about the relationships in your life, the people think they're close to you, but you only give them what you want them to have. And so you're not really close to a whole lot of people. You see what I'm saying? You, you, the relationship in your life, they're all surface because you don't let people in. Your consciousness tells you this is self-preservation. And so you protect your heart and your life and you put barriers and walls and everybody in your life only gets a certain part of you. That's how you know you're dealing with the spirit of rejection. Number two, you create a false self that you think people want to see or who they want you to be. Look at the text, the text. In order for me to get my father-in-law to respond and in order for me to get a husband and to have children, the best response is for me to pretend to be somebody else. Hmm. So I'm gonna cover my face up, I'm gonna cover my head up so people can't see me, they don't notice me. I'm gonna cover myself up and so when people, they don't recognize who I am because this is the only way that I get what I desire. So when I meet him, I can't be me, I have to be somebody else. So when I meet her, I gotta act like I got more than what I really have because if I can act like I have more than I really have and then I'm somewhere that I'm not, then she'll like me. And so now that I'm in the relationship and I'm in the marriage, I'm still showing her my representative because my representative is who she fell in love with because I don't want to experience rejection. So I'm going to pretend somebody type rejection. Mm, mm, mm. You create a false self because you know or you believe that that's what people need to see and that's what they desire. So. I'm going to disguise who I really am because mama told me I'll never have a man. I'll be single like all the women in my family. I'm talking about the things that I've heard over the years of counseling. So I'm, I'm going to disguise who I am because my daddy told me I was fat and I needed to lose weight and nobody wanted to be with the man who was obese. And so I, 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 I always have to perform this way. And so I, I have to, I'm just a habitual a liar. I'm always talking about where I am, what I'm doing, where I'm going, because that's what I believe people want, because I was always told that if I'm basic and I'm normal, don't nobody want a man who is basic, a woman who is basic. I need you to step into the real authentic you. So whoever comes in your life, they see the Christ in you. And the reason why the anointing can't be on your life is because the anointing can't find you because you're too busy disguising yourself to be somebody God never called you to be. Somebody say, I'm about to step out. I'm about to step out. I'm about to step out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But watch this. Number three. 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 You have an excessive need to be in control. You want to know if you're dealing with rejection? You have an excessive need to be in control. She says to herself, this is what she says to herself. God, you're taking too long. 
I'm getting too old. Everybody around me is getting married. I can no longer trust him. My heart is hurting. I don't really care about relationships. I don't care about love. I just want children. I don't care about any of that. So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I got a plan. Whenever you have to have a plan, instead of allowing God to do the moving, to do the leading, you got to be in control. And control is idolatry to you. You worship at the altar of being in control. Your timeline is probably your worst enemy. That list of what it needs to be and how he needs to look and where he needs to be. Let me tell you something. My wife is taller than me. E, e, mm, mm. Look at that. Look at that. Mm. You, you, let me tell you something. <laughs> ha, ha. Your need to be in control, your need to have all the answers, your need to have this list, your need, it's going to be one of the reasons that you miss it. She had to be in control. Another reason, another reason, number four. You know that, 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 that rejection is in your bloodline. You overstay in unhealthy environments when you know they don't have your best interests at heart. I'll sit that right there. How many of us know that we stayed in that marriage longer than we knew God ever desired or even got married to that person when you know good and well when you were going through premarital counseling and they rose all those red flags? I'm telling you, I've been in premarital counseling and I'm like, I know you see the red flags and I see so many red flags that the room has a red tint in it. But yet because you want to get married so badly. And you say to yourself, on the other side of the wedding ceremony, it's going to get better. Let me tell you something. A wedding ring will not cure infidelity. A wedding ring will not make you happy. A wedding ring ring will not cure loneliness. It will not cure your rejection because you will get married and then you'll find something else to be offended about. You'll find something else that you don't want to experience rejection concerning. And so you overstay, you tolerate people, you accept being second option because you don't think you can do better. Let me help you. Number five, the fifth reason you can determine that it's in your bloodline is you learn how to manipulate others to get what you want. Now, before you say this one doesn't apply to you, it probably applies to you more than the rest of them do. You manipulate others to get what you desire. When you lie about something, when you lie about who you are, when you pretend to be something that you aren't, when you hide things in your life, when you hide that wound, when you hide that offense, when you hide that desire, when you hide this ambition, when you debase yourself just so that you can be received by someone else, that is a form of manipulation because you're do you're actively doing something in order to get a desired result. So you know that if you don't open your mouth, and share this word. If you don't be honest, you know that if you if you be quiet and you don't say, if you don't be ambitious, if you don't talk about the money you're making, if you don't talk about you, you, you don't want to offend him, you don't want him to, to, to feel insecure, you don't you want him to love you, and so you must be the less you, the less version of you. That's manipulation. Because you're not leaning into the authenticity of who you are. So the the, the point is this, you learn how to manipulate others in order to get what you desire. That's how you know you're dealing with rejection. I I got one more. You respond to conflict by becoming emotionally distant and detached. Withdraw. Oh, let me tell you something about, let me tell you something about a wound of rejection that I had to to allow God to heal and the spirit of rejection that I continue to bind in and around my life. To the point that when me and my wife were in our dating phase for so many years, 
man, when I felt rejection, I shut down and we can have an argument where I may have felt disrespected. Regardless of whether or not I felt disrespected, it's how I responded to what I interpreted as disrespect. And it would take me a week to translate, to think through, to sit with this because my heart didn't process or receive rejection well because it's just something that I wouldn't talk to, talk about or deal with or allow God to fully deal with. I'm talking about how we handle offenses. I would shut down. I would get quiet. I would withdraw for weeks at a time because of rejection. And so I say that to say that many times you know that rejection is a dominant feature in your life because you you withdraw emotionally or you become detached. When you look in the text, look at this. Let me say it this way. I said it before. Here she is getting married. She's willing to get married. She's willing to have children with her father-in-law and has no desire on love has no desire to exchange any type of intimacy. She just wants children. She had become so emotionally detached that she just wanted a result. And sometimes we become numb. We withdraw. We create barriers. We don't let people in. We don't even let ourselves out when rejection is dominating our lives. And so the thing that we have to learn is this. I talked about number seven, and seven is when defensiveness is your default response to conflict, right? That's the number seven, but we kind of talked about defensiveness. But like I said before, you have to identify the source of the rejection. We can focus on Tamar, but Judah is the one who we need to look at. And then having a conversation with Judah, we understand that he didn't mean any harm. He was just doing what he learned. And he learned to deal with people in a transactional way because he saw how his father dealt with his brother Esau. He saw how his father dealt with Laban, how he saw how his father dealt with various people. And he saw how, and, and, and when he had a conversation with Jacob, then, then, then he learned when he talked to his father that his, his, his father Jacob had learned certain things from his mother. And so, so this thing is in their bloodline. Somebody say it runs in the family, but it stops with me. Identifying the source of the rejection helps us to create a plan of execution and healing. And it's no surprise that when Jesus begins his ministry, Luke 4, he says something that's powerful. He says, God has anointed me to come and to preach to the poor and to heal those who are brokenhearted. Because even Jesus knew that a heart which is broken, a soul that has experienced trauma, is someone who can't fully ever walk in their purpose. So I'm coming. And the first thing I need to do now that I'm here and my ministry has started, I need to find the people whose hearts are broken. For whatever reason their hearts are broken, I need to heal it. Because if you don't heal your heart, you will always mismanage your purpose. I'll help you. I'll help you. I'll help you. I'll help you. And so that's why he says, I need to come and to heal those whose hearts are broken. That's why the book of Proverbs says, I need you to protect your heart because protecting your heart is critical because everything in your life that you do flows from it. And the devil knows that everything, the devil knows that life flows from your heart. And because he knows this, you're looking for the great big attacks. You're looking for the devil to wage war in some great scheme. He's been waging war in your life with little small stones called rejection. 
Isaac, when you when you leave college, you're going to apply and you're going to get 21 different no's in the span of six months that people say that they don't want to hire you. Yeah. You're going to experience rejection where schools say, no, we're looking for somebody else. And you receive a letter and it says, we're great. You're such a great person for this job opportunity, but we're going to go in a different direction. And so the devil will try to wage war in a very strategic way. Let me get you offended and let you think that that's just a wound. And you say, God, I'm offended. I'm no longer offended. And you never give yourself permission to feel. And so you don't talk about it. And so many of us can't heal because we won't acknowledge that we feel. So we rush relationships. We force relationships because we don't want to experience that familiar wound, that familiar something. But God says, I am a healer and I don't just want to touch the surface. I need you to give me backstage access to your life and your heart. I need all of you, not just what people see on social media, not just what's on the surface, because some of us, our wounds, our trauma runs deep. That rejection you don't want to talk about because it uncovers what happened to you when you were five years old. Nobody thought that you remembered that 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 sexual assault. Somebody didn't think that you remembered those words that they spoke. They only spoke it one time, but it still is lodged somewhere in your spirit, somewhere in your psyche, somewhere in your heart. And that spirit wants you to keep it there but I speak healing over your life. I speak transformation over your life. I speak a release from control. Your past is given to God and God will redeem the time that is lost. The need to be in control is given to God. God, I'm going to trust you. Even if it's not today, even if it's not tomorrow, God, I'm going to trust you. And I praise God for this moment that those of us who have experienced rejection and those of us who have not yet admitted that rejection is the main character in my marriage, in my singleness, in my life, in my decision making. Today is the day that you're releasing that and giving it to God. Lord, help us to recover from the rejection that we've experienced. We give our hearts to you. We give our lives to you. And we trust you today. We trust you with our tomorrow. I speak healing over your lives today. Release over your lives today. I speak transformation over your marriage, over your singleness, over your job, over your children, over your parents, over all of those relationships. And that video that you keep pressing play and you're replaying and you're replaying and it's dogging your emotions, that's the, that's the video that you give God, that tape recorder you give to God because God is about to transform you today. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.